GM lays off thousands of workers, five plants up for closure. Pump and dump scheme of medical marijuana companies and the trucking raid firm they acquired. The National Academies of Sciences outlines a path forward for a study of twin 33 trailers. Like a gun to my head, drivers weigh in on ELDs, pay, and parking. And finally, we play 8 or 10 good minutes with VP of Strategic Analytics, Scott Friesen from Echo Global Logistics. I'm JP. And I'm Chad. And we discuss all these issues and more on this week's episode of What the Truck. Hey, JP. Wow, what a special uh, opportunity that we have in this uh, holiday season. Yeah. What are we imbibing Oh, I think I hear the clinkling of some ice and glass, <laughs> suggesting that we're not doing our normal... Uh, you know, hop infused adult beverage, but it's no. something a little bit more exciting. And I'll have to tell the backstory. Oh, okay. At Market Waves, at the Uber Freight party, they had this special drink um, called the Uber Freight, which is really just a nice old fashioned. And we had, might have had one too many of those with Scott Freese. Eh, one too many. I mean, what's really the right number? Three. Amongst friends. Yeah. So we hung out with Scott, had some drinks, uh, really kind of jammed. And he sent us a nice, like, uh, holiday, like, like Christmas gift. These, these bottles of bitter milk number one, um, this sort of handcrafted cocktail mixer. It's basically the stuff you put in whiskey to make an old fashioned. So he, we got those in the mail. Thank you, Scott. Um, and so we made an old fashioned. Shout out to Scott. We're not above taking gifts uh, for some good coverage. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Scott. No, really, thank you. Thank you. And um, whew, bitter milk indeed. Uh, it's good stuff. It's, yeah. it's, it's a nice, sweet little syrup that uh, kind of complements the rye, uh, with the bullet rye whiskey that, that we're having. So Yeah, because um, we're uh, uh, you know coming live to you from uh, um, where we're live right now. Yeah. Uh, and we're coming to you from Tennessee, which yeah. is still the frontier in some regards. <laughs> and Yeah, and don't <laughs> worry, we're not taking it up a notch. We're, we're, we'll be back to our regular scheduled beer programming next week and but. be assured listeners we are sipping judiciously <laughs> okay uh let, let's get into it man well take it away you've you've got the um, the headline sheet there yeah so gm um oh yes closing down five plants lay, laying off tons of workers good time it's a huge <laughs> right yeah i mean it's a huge kind of shift in the industry you know ford earlier this year said it was kind of getting out of the sedan game yeah, I thought that was interesting with Ford. Um, yeah, it's sort of like, are these two, um, you know, uh, companies taking diff- uh, similar tracks, but not, not not quite doing the exact same thing with the timing, but are they both kind of doing the same thing? And anyway, I, I guess background on Ford before we hit what GM has done. Um, Ford, you know, has, you know, for quite some time, uh, they have been uh, recognizing that sales on sedans, hatchbacks, um, Basically, you know, the, the traditional kinds of cars that have sold well for them um, just simply are not selling well. And in a competitive business with, I think it, with like, it's it's hard. It's not that there's necessarily low margins, but it's uh, that it's it's slow to grow at this point in the automobile industry. Yeah. That they're saying, look, we're going to like consumers want like the SUVs and the trucks where you have a command seating position and you have extra, you know, cargo um, um, and, yeah, and, and yeah. passenger space, and they make they make those are more expensive vehicles. They make better margins on light trucks and uh, SUVs, and so one of the critiques it's, from, it's almost like yeah. an upsell. You know, it's like instead of buying a, a sedan, point. people are buying you know a crossover mm-hmm. SUV. But one of the, the the criticisms I've read from a number of analysts on that particular point is um, they're like, yeah, but how are you going to make up like? three or four hundred thousand in sales you know how are you going to replace those sales it doesn't seem likely and then this gets to the point of how you know Mm -hmm. maybe gm and ford are doing similar things downsizing you know how are you really going to replace all of those sedan 
right, sales right, right. just with SUVs and trucks, Ford, you know, right. and, and it doesn't seem likely, and it does seem like quietly. So are they just like Ford is like making ab- abdicating some, market share to the Toyotas and the Hondas of the world? You know, you know, you know, like you know the Toyota, I, the Corolla, and the Camry that are such best selling sedans. Are they just kind of giving up and saying like, okay, we're going to let them take over? I don't want to give an unmitigated, you know, yes, but I will just say that from what I've heard and read, it seems so. Mm-hmm. Like, because people, some people are like, well, if you want the rounded car, you want to <clears> like whatever, like go get, get yourself a Honda. You know, they they, yeah. they certainly do it, you know, really well or whatever. So yeah, it's they're, interesting. They're popular. And I think there are really three stories behind this, you know, GM. closing down. Yeah, yeah, GM and Ford. So let's give, we should probably yeah, give yeah. the background. Yeah, get, so, yeah. so uh, you know, the, they, they're closing down, what, the, the Lordstown, Ohio plant that makes the, um, the Chevy Cruze? Well, five, five plants here in North America. Um, two are in Canada, three in the U.S., and then also, kind of unreported, two others globally. Mm. So seven total. And what they're saying is roughly uh, what amounts to 15% of their total workforce. Right. Um, you know, uh, s- several thousand of both um, uh, what, what they would call white-collar and factory workers. The white-collar workers, apparently, since October, have already been getting you know severances and right, right. have been kind of anticipating this but all the news is kind of coming out at once right. and um there has been some you know plenty of political blowback as well although um what's the ceo's name of gm mary barra yeah and and what what did she say that was kind of enigmatic yeah she uh, said you know she said gm is not does not foresee an economic downturn on the horizon but and they we, want to do this while the economy is strong. But they want to get in front of it while the economy is still strong. So it kind of sounds like okay, well you do kind of anticipate something. And I think I see, right. there are really three factors I think influencing this, or three sort of even you could think of them as cycles. One of them is okay. is what they're being kind of most upfront about, which is uh, changing consumer demand. That's hard to argue with, you know. Um, you know, the preference for trucks and SUVs over sedans. The second, yes. the second one is the macroeconomic picture. You know, are they trying to tighten things up and get leaner and focus on their high margin products before a downturn comes, before, um, yes. you know, before consumer demand falls off and they're, they, they're ba- making all these cars that no one's buying. They're trying to get ahead of the cycle. It's interesting. Um, Ibrahim Bayan um, in the webinar he did with Craig the other day was talking mm-hmm. about how um, when the economy really gets going and especially when you have things like tax cuts that put extra money in people's pockets, you see a, a, a temporary increase in spending because the people have pent up demand. Sure. So, so I, I, might, I might be driving a beater and know that I need a new car. But if I don't have consumer confidence, if I don't have money in my pocket, if I don't have cash in the bank, I'm going to hold off on that purchase until I do. When the economic expansion hits, people start doing that. As the economic expansion ages, that pent-up demand is dissipated. So the, one of the ideas is like if we've been in a really long economic expansion now, mm-hmm. everyone has replaced the cars that they were going to replace. And so we could see a fall off of demand just from that. And the last, so hmm. you know, so consumer consumer preference, macroeconomics, and the final thing I think is really interesting is, you know, are they saying something about the future of car ownership? Are they saying something about, you know, are people going to, the families going to get by on one car and then subscribe to a ride hailing service? Are they going to? What is? How does the rise of autonomous cars, especially when coupled with you know, ride sharing services like Uber or Lyft, how does that change the economics and demographics of car ownership? Are people going to just be buying fewer cars, period? And so that's mm. more of like a long term yeah. structural shift in the industry. You know, we, we, we talk about like cycles, like economics, we, we talk about structural things, you know, that are more long term. But I wonder kind of what the mix of those three factors 
is in the thinking of both Ford and GM. Wow, that's a complex synthesis, man. Um, good stuff. I, you're right. I, I'm really, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm with you on all, all three of those. The first two are like, you know, sort of front of, of mind and, 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 and direct. But the other one, yeah, I think is kind of buried um, in, uh, I, I, I don't know how much it is specifically a part of the story, but you're right. That is, it's coming down the pipe. Um, you know, and, 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 by, and the GM thing, I think you could see in a couple of different ways. Like, on the one hand, you know, as Sherrod Sherrod Brown, the mm-hmm. senator, said, you know, you can see them really just kind of like taking advantage of the, the tax cuts and, and, the, and just like running away and hiding. And, and yeah, he you said know, it was really like the, the height of the, corporate greed or something like that. May, that might have been a little bit, you know, histrionic, but that's what politicians kind of need to do to get people's attention and rally people or something. We're talking I mean, about a company that filed bank. Not that, long ago. that was I mean, my second point. It's like like on the on, other, dude. by yeah, by the other end of the you know continue or spectrum, but you know by by contrast, they they and this is what to GM's credit and defense, this is what they say. Um, they've learned some hard lessons and they're going to be quick to act. And they're also responding. They say that they've lost a billion dollars in in revenue this year. Uh, yeah, and they, they get hit say by the tariffs. They say it's a result of the tariffs. Yeah. So they're just Their input costs. You can say they're being agile for a giant company a giant country i mean company trying to be uh agile right Uh, and it's ultimately kind of you know maybe the federal government could take a page out of their playbook like you tighten the belt when things are good so that you have extra resources for when times are bad like you know what i mean like yeah like uh, it's an interesting story yeah it really uh, is it's a a, a, a huge deal and it's it's really complicated uh it's a it's a big industry shift it obviously affects because of that it affects freight you know it'll it'll be interesting to see what for example uh cross-border um Mexican rail, you know, like I'm thinking of Kansas City Southern, who has like like 13 or 14 percent of all their car loadings are bringing me- cars built in Mexico up into the U.S. I wonder what what this does for their business. Um, I wonder what it yeah, does. I mean, they, yeah, they, they shifted operations this very year of the Chevy Blazer, uh, the GM Chevy Blazer to Mexico, which yeah. is another reason. Yeah, and so, so those cars have to be transported um, by someone, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, the, but they're not cutting that plant. So anyway, no, 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 I mean, no that's no. what I'm saying. So like, no. if, if oh. things are leaving the U.S., you know, assuming oh. that Americans buy roughly the same number of vehicles, they have to be brought, being brought in from somewhere, and they'll be yeah. they'll be brought in by transportation companies. Anyway, um, so. That's super interesting. Uh, why don't you take the lead on this next story? You wrote the article, Chad. It was this really weird, you know, it's this the the, the medical marijuana pump and dump scheme. These penny stocks uh, bought this non-existent load, load board and tried to really like do this like PR campaign about how it was a huge deal. I don't. Can you tell <laughs> us yeah. what's going on. Well, I mean, just like you know, basically on. Um, uh, Tuesday, uh, um, we came across, uh, you know, what's like kind of an interesting looking story that I forget the exact name of it. We'd have to look at the article, but it was like, you know, medical marijuana companies snap, snap up, up truck uh, rate, trucking rate, rate firm. firm. And we're like, okay, right. You know, like, well, let's, let's, it ends up being... A 154-word article, which is, you know, scant. It seems press releasey. Um, but they had an image of Great Raid Freight, the, the, um, apparently the trucking raid firm that had been snapped up. And, uh, and so, I mean, it, you know, a, a little thought had gone into it, but there was no byline. No specific author had written this. Um, which is not a good sign for journalism. <sighs> Yeah, like someone needs little, to, someone needs to like uh, take responsibility for but it. But it wasn't even like the, the it wasn't it had nothing to do with the medical marijuana thing. It was just like the claims that the article was making, like one like weird little kind of connection point and stat after another. Kind of like we were just like we kept kind of raising our eyebrows. Yeah, uh, collectively. So at first, it was like yeah. you know, okay, are these medical marijuana companies trying to figure out the logistics of moving? legal marijuana right that was our first uh, assumption which does actually it doesn't make sense because as soon as you think about it you're like okay wait is there ever going to be a 50 foot you know a 53 foot truckload of weed (laughs) 
Like no, like like of whatever like the like, company no, like right. like dispensaries Good point. and stuff. Even, they even get though, supplied even, with like a couple pounds at a time. Well, even though they were claiming that one of the companies, they, there's so many weird things about this story that it yeah. became fun to um, dive in and absolutely just annihilate. And, and the reason Over that the we tangled webs we <laughs> weave when first right. we practice to deceive. Right. Um, you know, and I said something to that effect in the article. Um, and I would encourage our listeners to just check out the article to follow like exactly like, you know, how kind of insidious yeah. and weird the whole thing is. But it did seem to be ultimately um, I guess a pump and dump scheme. Yeah, these two penny stocks. Yeah. Penny stocks means like, you know, basically um, a couple of companies that claim to be unrelated, which is weird, you know, like, well, you're unrelated, but together you're going to buy some some trucking rate firm. Well, OK, but yeah, these two the penny stocks means they're basically a worthless company. They, they're not worth anything, but technically they exist. But if you are, I looked it up um, like penny, like a penny stock kind of company means that they don't have to do official up reporting. Right. And they and so like their numbers are hidden their numbers you know and which means they're probably very um they're, they're very low yes as you're just basically cutting to the chase relatively worthless yeah so and, what you and, do and the and the, the, the first couple things that piqued our interest were that, were right. that they're really like inaccurate dubious claims about the potential of this load board that they buy essentially was what it was well yeah the the trucking rate firm was yeah. supposedly some kind of load board which yeah and they just looked like some dude like slapped up a website first of all they like, said that they were going to address like this huge market of seven million truck drivers in the u.s which there's nowhere close to seven million that truck was the very first thing that got all of our attention we're then, like there aren't seven million truck drivers then they said that they were going to charge 20 percent per load on their load board which is completely insane like load boards don't charge percentages per load they charge a small flat monthly user fee oh, like yeah. even if you went to an actual human broker and called them and just made them do all the work to find you a truck and book it and take care of it and do all that they'll they'll charge you 15 percent uh, typically 12 to 15 percent like so they're saying that this electronic load board that adds no real value is going to get 20 percent and they're like saying oh yeah we're gonna get 60 million revenue 30 million profit well the thing like, i think that the overall th th like this is like in a sense this was an easy target yeah because like the, like there's some there, look i mean i am not as by any stretch of the imagination some kind of like in, in, like i don't understand a lot of finance stuff i am not a sophisticate right, but like right. you could just tell that this was um clumsily done by you know probably and i hate to be rude to these guys if they're listening um but just like just not very they're not very intelligent or savvy or sophisticated about the very kinds of things that they were trying to do it seems like you know they had a lot of um cojones a lot of huevos uh <laughs> for you know like uh like just like okay i'm going to send out press releases on the global newswire about, about me how, acquiring something for, for millions of dollars and about how you know my company is about to explode in value uh, and, and all these things not. you know to inflate it which maybe they had seen the somebody must have seen somebody do something like uh, th because there are just so many things wrong with what they were trying to do their math was wrong they, they didn't do their due yeah, diligence I think this is it's really easy just, to poke holes it's kind of like you know and so it was kind of fun they have the stock that that's worth you know half a penny a share if it goes up to two pennies which is still nothing. All I of a sudden, they quadruple their money and they get out and boom, it's over. That's that's the essence of a pump and dump scheme. I, like they uh, gin up some favorable press releases and you know create this this temporary the two, appearance. The, yeah, right. Exactly. Happening. Yeah, they'll, they'll that's create. All, and that's they, all they need. That's what they're gonna do. They they would uh, they would create <coughs> some temporary value, so people would jump in and buy it, raise the stock valuation, and as soon as it reached a certain peak of performance, then the you know those vested parties they would be like, okay, we've reached what we want to do, and we're out. You know, yeah, and, and everybody else, and then it would and collapse. What's kind of weird is that tra Transport Topics picked this up like three weeks after it was on the PR Newswire. It was on so the PR Newswire the, the on November seventh. The whole thing was probably 
they're already over by then. Yeah, right. Yeah. And transport topics. I guess we're going to name name names because this is part of why we were disappointed because we respect transport topics. But like, if you you know an authoritative transportation source, uh, you know, like you know, just kind of like you know, giving credence and credibility yeah. to um, a clear pump and dump scheme like it didn't take us it took us minutes not hours to um figure out okay this is this was yeah yeah um and and we don't want to you don't want to give people like that um you know uh you don't want to dilute attention your your brand and your credibility and there's that waste editorial resources on stuff that's but we did spend our time on the editorial resources tracking down the um the 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 parties that be and they were a rush Rushnet, Rushnet. I reached out to Rushnet and X Y Z Hemp, and Great Rate Freight, um, Great Rate Freight. Uh, boy, what a name! Great. And Freight. you know, and guess what? One Freight. of the one of the things that Great Rate Freight was going to do was um, they're creating an app called the Truck Stop. And yeah, um, the truck stop. This is one of their clumsy things. Not, it's like it's like not, either they ran out of ideas, or or. Um, they just didn't realize that, you know, there is one of the, the biggest load boards in the industry is called truckstop.com. Or um, they wanted to or kind of blur a, the lines. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it was, Any or all of the above. It was very weird. And <laughs> so, um, yeah. So but fun, to, fun to kind of uncover these weird, like, I, I love the stories of like the investigative stories where it's like, there's something that seems too good to be true, and of course it is, and then you start going down these rabbit holes, and it's all connected, and there's all these shady people, and you're trying to, and the emails don't work, and the websites right, right, are right. bullshit, and like... Yeah, 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 and that was part of my challenge on that day, was to, uh, I, w- I did my due diligence, and I reached out to like four or five of the possible PR release contacts that were provided. Um, I got zero responses even to this moment on them, but I did get, I mean, two other of the emails that I sent to have bounced back as not existing. Wow. So, I mean, um, and, but it is, and the challenge was to dig as deep as you can, knowing that you're not going to get a response. And I mean, I looked at the privacy policy of Great Rate Freight, and it was really, like, really, like, it too, like their press releases, was poorly written. It was very amateurish. There were typos. There were, like, incomplete sentences. There, like, and there was all kinds of language. In the, it seemed like yeah, some yeah, attorney yeah. was in there saying that, you know, third parties could use the information that you input. And, and it was just like, like, scammy. It was just scammy all the way around. So anyway, good times. I mean, not, you know, like, yeah, it was, it was sad fun. but true. We, we, we actually recorded a video about it with Craig and you and me and Zach Strickland in the office. So... If you want to check out um, the Freight Waves Twitter feed, you can probably see that video where we are uh, kind of, it's before your article actually came out, but it was sort of our initial reactions to this sort of absurd item that we found in one of our, you know, esteemed peer publications. Okay. um, I think, yeah, so we, we need to get into this thing about the National Academy of Sciences study on the twin 33 foot long trailers um so you know as as you guys know right now a lot of ltl carriers like to use twin 28 foot uh trailers you know you you might see fedex ground or ups or xpo hauling these you know it's occasionally you'll see these like double trailers and you'll be like what what really like i don't why don't i always see those and right and they're smaller and it's like the whole idea is like okay instead it, it 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 helps if you think about it from the power unit's perspective, it it uh, reduces the number of stops you have to make because instead of stopping to unload, you know, a a pallet here, a pallet there, a pallet there, you can drop the trailer at a DC, let it go. Why out. do they have you? you mean, you're talking about like why do they have twins? Yeah, 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 yeah. Not just you can drop you can drop the trailer at a DC, let it go out into like a you know a, a stray truck or something like that. Um, and then be you know pick up another trailer or whatever but, you know go along your merry way. 
and, and so yeah, and, and and the overall, I mean, story is, is that um, there there are certain vested um, parties within uh, trucking. This is what you know. People often we often refer to the fragmented trucking industry, and um, it's because there are vested parties with vested interests, and um, there are you know some that like are going to say no, that you should not have a trailer any larger than you know the the standard size of. Uh, 53 and, and there's all these complicated things about how much weight can go over each axle and but it's you know it's the it's the 53 foot length you can't go over that and and really and they, they they'll say safety 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 but really there's these vested interests yeah it comes down to why like, they only want it to be it comes, so big yeah people have adapted to the you know large carriers large ltl carriers have adapted to the current regulatory regime and they have built their business model around it right. and control their market share based on these current d- dimensional regulations and weight regulations. And if it changes, you know, they kind of like feel like, okay, other people can start to undercut us on price. Other people can, we're, we're but others, capacity. others want bigger, others want bigger. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. And, uh, and specifically L- the LTL side of things. Um, the, uh, which, uh, well, and one of the things I think I reported on a, a story about weight limits. I didn't even know what I was stepping into, you know, earlier in the year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. and, uh, we got a lot of, um, you know, um, I got a lot of inf- uh, information from what happens in like Australia where, um, they don't have such regulations and they're, you know, like at first it seems like it's really creative. Like you can side load and you can have enormous amount, and you can like double stack and and you can just do all kinds of things, and you can like, like basically almost like create a train. Yeah, a with road your train truck. of like three trailers. But it does seem like, upon further review, you know, while I was like at first, I was like, let's, why can't we do this? Let's have freedom. Let's let them be. But you know, when you do the studies of the roadways, right? As this, as it, as this article um, of our managing editor Brian Straits points out, that basically they're getting more serious about doing a study. They're not going to keep wasting time. Time like they have in the past and they're going to do an authentic study and they're going to take into consideration both sides of the argument and and what you know it's like and one of the these sides of the argument for not increasing weights is infrastructure itself mm-hmm. weight limit capacities that the asphalt and the conditions yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah that's, and, that's, a, that's a real thing for sure yeah um, um, and so and so how many trucks would we really keep off this is to me the central question um, it's, it's safety because of braking distances they talk about. But like how many trucks, how many miles of how many trucks would we really keep off the highways, which would, would it technically reduce that many accidents and all the things that the parties right. who want the weight limits to be, you know, freed yeah. up? How much would it really make a difference? I was less than convinced. I don't really know, like... You know, maybe there's a calculation of like, okay, we can do this many more pallets on 233s instead of 228s. But I mean, yeah. first of all, are all these trucks always full? Like, I know, you right? Know what I mean? like, That's exactly what I, I are, was are we so, to. Are we suddenly going to get universal adoption of all of these trucks? I mean, a lot, a lot of the small people don't, you know, necessarily want to have to buy a bunch of new equipment. Well, there's that for compete. sure. That's part of it. But like, I'm, I'm almost, I'm like wondering like what you just said about how full are they really already? And like, and so would it really just mean a lot of larger trucks that might not be running at full capacity anyway? Would the stats that the advocates yeah. point out really, would it really mean like what with 3 billion less truck miles on the road right, per year? Right. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But they're doing a study on it. And, and well, and, and inquiring the, minds and the, want to the know. The study, the four year long study said that the data was inconclusive for them to create a Previously. path, a path yes. going forward. And um, so that's why everybody's frustrated. You mean you spent four years to say that? No, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, I could have told you that. <laughs> you know, like, pay me uh, to, to make a study that says I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> um, 
Maybe that's what they're doing already. Uh, no, but there's a really cool uh, study. That, I mean, not study so much, but like, some, you know, <coughs> our uh, one of our um, recent additions to our editorial staff, Linda Baker, um, stationed out in uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, she did a cool, I would I would call it an ethnographic field research study. Yeah, she, she went to this really famous um, truck stop in Oregon called Jubitz. That is like huge. It's not part of a chain. It's been kind of resistant to. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't been there myself, but from I what, haven't been to Portland. From what I understand, it's like the truck stop of truck stops. Like it's there's multiple restaurants. There's a movie theater. Whoa. There's it's like a huge, really cool place. Um, and she was there to kind of write about a profile of the the guy who runs that place and owns it. But the, a second story kind of emerged as she met truck drivers there and just interviewed them and took pictures. And it's so, a cool article. Um, yeah, with, and so if you want to check it out on FreightWaves.com, it's called Like a Gun to My Head, Drivers Weigh In on ELDs, Pay, and Parking News on it, November 27th. Which is a, um, a fun headline, um, and it does come from uh, one of the uh, truckers that she interviewed who just said that, you know, he feels like, you know, like, while mo generally speaking, I would say that, you know, surprisingly for all of their um, pet peeves and, you know, beefs or challenges, things that they're not super happy about, um, that ELDs don't seem to be, you know, like, you know, a big complaint now. But the, a lot of people have gotten used to it. A lot of the really professional drivers beforehand were already, you know, yeah. I mean, if you were following your hours of service you know nothing's really changed but but it does feel like it can be at times like a gun well, to your head well, and, yeah. the, and the reason is because of what's been spotlighted not so much elds but hours of service yes yeah right? and so it, it, it's basically just like the problem with the, the e-logs or the elds is that if you do have a, a violation you can't really go back in your paper locks and fix it. It's going to be in the device. It's always going to be there. The next time you get pulled over and the officer checks the e-log, he'll see the violation. Like it's So you've got this kind of creeping anxiety as your hours start to run out. And that's what I think the, right. the driver meant when he said it felt like a gun to his head. Like, you know, you've got to do this. You've got to get to this point by this time and shut down. Otherwise, boom, it's another violation in this Eli. Oh, I mean, it's it's a tough job. I mean, any of us who have driven for Thanksgiving weekend or anything, you know, and, that, and a few of the takeaways from the article from like re reading from their points of view is like, you know, one driver said it doesn't feel like there's rush hour. It just feels like there's it's rush day, like yeah. the congestion's accumulated, um, you know, the, like so, what the freedom that some feel is, you know, they're, they're like some say say that like, well, I don't really, you know, you know, interact with other people real well. So that's kind of why I like to drive, <laughs> but right. you know, which isn't surprising, but you know, and some like the freedom of, I can sing to myself and I can, you know, and I'm, I feel, you know, freeing on my own and independent. I like the places that I see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Road. It was really cool. She asked all these some different talk drivers. About loneliness. She asked all these different drivers about like how much money they make, what their employment situation the money's is. money's interesting. What they like about it. Yeah. We, I mean, we saw some drivers making some pretty good money. I mean, yeah, like, okay, so, like, we saw a couple of stats in this article. One said he made um, one, 160 and one gross. said and gro gross 160 gross 160 right and then he said and, and then everything was taken away from that so yeah, the, yeah. another said 150 uh and said half of that w is basically it's you net. know yeah. yeah so you net about half of that which uh still ain't bad until you think about the fact that that guy drove 80 Thousand. That's eighty thousand with a th miles. <laughs> I mean, it's just a lot of miles, man. You know, and like and the crazy thing is, it's not even that much for for an over. No, it's actually driver. he said I'm winding it down. Yeah, I know. You it's know, like, I was like, dude. what yeah. the heck? And I mean, so like, I mean, th that one. So that guy actually it sounded like you know, it's kind of, it's Oregon, which is kind of interesting because you don't really associate the Pacific Northwest with high rates. But I mean, to drive eighty thousand miles and 
in net and, and or gross, gross 150. 150. I mean, he's getting some pretty good because you got you yeah, got to factor not in quite like, two dollars a mile maybe, you, but you, you know, got to factor in like deadhead and stuff like that. Yeah, right. And right. So like, was, yeah, you know. That's, yeah, he that's, that he's in. getting some pretty good price freight up there. Yeah, it's intense, but it's not a bad gig. Why, why is there this so-called driver shortage? Well, it's because of the millennials. The millennials don't want to work. <laughs> well, and, yeah, yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah, they say I that. I mean, for one, you're a millennial, and I don't mean to offend you. <laughs> well, I'm also, I'm also, yeah. No, I'm, I'm a, not a church driver either, so. Yeah. I guess no, I'm, I'm part of the in problem. In general, it's a difficult um, job. Yeah, but check out that article. It's really cool just to yes. get, like, kind of, you see the pictures of the drivers. You kind of hear their situation, why they're in it, what they like about the lifestyle, what they don't. It's kind of a cool just you know, survey, really. Absolutely good ethnographic field research essay. I mean, not essay, but just an article uh, by Linda Baker. Way to bring it. All right, now it is time, without further ado, for you to begin us off with a uh, big deal, little deal, JP. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, what's the deal with you? Let's do this. Um... Yeah, so, it, no, so I think I'm, I'm going to ask you the yeah, notes you're, first. You're yeah, first. Yeah, I know. I'm okay. ready. I'm ready. It, it, it depends on you. Um, okay, so ready or not, here we come. Fleet Complete Equity Acquired by a Pension Fund Guides for 10 Times Growth. Big deal or little deal? It's a big deal. Um, I talked to the CEO, uh, Tony, of um, Fleet Complete, and he said he emphasized the um, long-term vision of the pension fund as opposed to a VC firm with limited partners. JB Hunt Project 44 signed an IT pact allowing Hunt customers to access all carrier data on one platform. Big deal or little deal? I think it's the biggest deal is for Project 44, which is obviously obviously landed a massive enterprise uh, customer account. XBO launches last mile delivery tracking through Google search. Big deal or little deal? Um, I think it's a little deal, although I do think that the last mile bit of it is where visibility is, is most needed. Arrive Logistics launches Chattanooga office. Big deal or little deal? It's a big deal. I had a great time uh, hanging out with the Arrive people. Um, they're expanding rapidly and they want to uh, add lots of jobs. Rally is building an on-demand bus ride sharing market for the U.S. Big deal or little deal? It's uh, you know they're shining. It's a big deal. I mean they're shining a light on the overbooked mobility as a overlooked mobili- mobility as a service bus sharing space with an attractive business model and innovative marketing. AGL CEO visibility next year's goal adaptability and automation three year outlook big deal or little deal I'm gonna say little deal uh, you know it's like it's uh, you know it's baby steps it's about visibility it's a huge company doing awesome things um, it's a cool article but um, we've been covering this all year Echo Global CEO the role of brokers one size fits all technology and other 2019 questions big deal or little deal again huge company doing awesome things but I'm going to say little deal I mean automation is making humans more efficient uh, you know tech works for each different supply chain with this what they're doing no shocking predictions here Goods trade deficit widens against as exports fall imports rise <laughs> big deal from a freight perspective it means uh, less volume into ports and less surface freight uh, yeah, dispersing we, we, goods. We, we, we lost. That's okay, but I'm still going to like <laughs> say what I feel like thinking, thinking about this. <laughs> Big deal. And it's like, but you know, basically we expect downward pressure on the freight demand into 2019. I guess that's not a shocker. But um, okay, so um, don't don't shush me right in the middle of my. Well, now come you're on, like, now, you're like, like big deal. And then I was like, oh, we're right at the thing. And then you kept going and going. I was like, Whoa. <laughs> I kept going and going. Yeah, and that's sorry, funny. sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I think funny. I got us off to a bad start with the. With the first answer, I feel like, just a little went a little long, and yeah, it's kind of like no, a re- it's hard to bat lead off. Sometimes you feel you got to kind of warm up. I was kind of um, thinking yeah. like, but also like a four in a four by four hundred relay, four by one hundred relay, yeah. or whatever in the Olympics. The first person, if they're slow, dude. The, that's true. That's th- well. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, but at the same time, you had three big deals out of four. I mean, at least that's according to you. <laughs> and I only had two, so you had more to, more to say. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I don't. I don't Goodbye, know. Uh, 
Um, yes, or come by here. Seconds over, so not that bad. Oh, not that bad, says not so silent Layla. That's, that's a difference. Um, yes, Layla, thanks for participating and for being our producer here. Layla Rapp, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and, and all of these articles, by the way, you know, they're, they're more in depth than we can possibly uh, try to discuss here um, in these brief episodes. Thanks for tuning in and drive safely out there, America. Now it's time for not five, but eight or ten good minutes with Scott Friesen from Echo Global Logistics. He's the VP of Strategic Analytics. Hey, so we are coming live to you from Market Waves 18. JP and I are joined by Scott Friesen of Echo Global Logistics. Yeah, Scott, it was great hanging out with you at uh, the party last night um, at the Glass Cactus. That was cool. I feel like we had kind of a mind meld. With the uh, world's greatest cover band. Yeah. Right? The world city they band. were strong. They, they, were, they, they were brought strong. it. They brought it. They did. What was your high point? Of the Emerald City Band? Yeah. The... Undoubtedly, it was when Brian Rudich from Hubtran sang Neil Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was nice. fantastic. And even, I have, a, I have photographic evidence. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, I've got the shot of him like raising his hand in the air with a pointed finger. I mean, it was right out of... Perfect. What's the name of that movie? The, the, not the soul singer. The wedding pop singer. singer. The wedding singer. No, no, no. It's a Neil Diamond oh. thing. Anyway. I, was, I, I'm so, I, I it am was a pretty, fan. It was pretty I, epic. Um, that, that sounds epic. It was good. That's a good one. My low point was when they tried to do the uh, Guns N' Roses, Sweet Child of Mine. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. She just was... That, that was not as convincing. But overall, it's hard, you know, it's Axel hard Rose to be voice. at an Axel Rose. It is, level. even with three lead singers that can kind of cover all the octaves, you know, He's such as very, they were doing. They don't have unique voice. Yeah, she, she didn't have that like weird, like, like primates scream. Yeah, yeah that like porcine squeal. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Know. Okay. well, he does um, have one of sort of truly the, one of the great voices in rock. Oh, yes, to I deny. totally agree. Yes, I would give a top 10 uh, porcine squeal of all time. Right, it's like trying to, it's, it's like trying to sing, like, like trying to do, like, Mariah Carey at karaoke. It's like you're, you're fucked. You just ask him for <laughs> trouble. <laughs> right. Kind of just trouble. Um, well, it's great to lasso you in. Um, like, uh, what, what, uh, what are you, um, what are you focused on here at the conference? Any, any, um, anything of interest striking you? Yeah, I, I really like the technology demos yeah. because I feel like it's important to stay on top of all the development that's going on in the space. And I had conversations with you know our IT teams and our leadership and just want to make sure that we keep a finger on the pulse of what's getting developed out there, either potentially from a competitive standpoint, but also potentially from a collaborative standpoint. Some of the right. technologies that we've seen might be technologies that we want to integrate into some of our offerings. So, so you, you do partnerships. Do you guys um, make acquisitions in we technology? Do. Uh, in technology, we don't have a lot of history in that. Um, but, uh, you know, we, I, think, I think everything's always on the table. Right. Well, um, well, let's. Are you are you ready to play five good minutes? Yeah. Well, let's, let's and, like, what are we gonna ask you? Uh, like, well, what let, you do um, at Globe, or what you do at Echo? Let's just just play along and just see if if he can execute with no with no warning. Fly without a net. <laughs> I'm ready. At, Is that I'm all right? Ready, I'm ready at the edge of the trapeze. <laughs> Laugh like you've never been heard. You know, dance, <laughs> dance like no one's watching. <laughs> You know what? Um, if you if you execute it, you've got either a free Michael Lewis book or a backpack. We've got that in it for you. We're raising the bar here. Um, okay, so ready or not, here right. we come. Uh, Scott, you want to tell us a little bit, brief background about Echo, what you guys are doing, how long you've been apart? Sure. Uh, Echo is a leading technology-based 3PL, a uh, managed transportation provider. Uh, we've got uh, clients of all different sizes. Uh, and uh, we're full multimodal. We move all kinds of freight, all kinds of modes. Uh, we're a public company and okay. um, have a lot of strength in LTL, full truckload, intermodal, partials, the, the whole smash. Um, I've been with the company uh, in-house about two and a half years. I consulted with the company for about a year and a half before that. So I'm about four years into my freight life, as it were. Um, 
and uh, and been working with Echo for that time. Okay. Last night we were talking a little bit about the timeline for like true digitization of uh, the supply chain. When are we going to see the kinds of you know step changes that financial services went through you know, starting ten years ago? Um, where where are where are your thoughts on that, Scott? And what's what's the low hanging fruit that can be done now versus the stuff that's harder to resolve? I think it's going to take a little while. I think we had talked about about a five year timeline. I think that's realistic. Um, from the outside, these things look dramatic. They look like huge tectonic shifts. But on the inside of companies, the change is probably more step by step, more incremental in nature inside. And I say that because we're engaged with a bunch of different initiatives where we're trying to fix a particular problem or solve a particular need. And I don't get up every day thinking that today we're going to revolutionize the freight industry. We, I get up every day and I work with my team and I work with all of the collaborators at Echo and the leadership team to fix problems and solve particular problems. By the time you add all those pieces together, by the time we succeed in accomplishing those things, I do think it'll be quite transformative. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, there aren't there aren't sparks <laughs> flying, uh, you know, <laughs> magically around the office. So so some of those involve pricing, matching loads to trucks, some of the technology that we've seen at this conference, you know, are addressing some of the same kinds of problems that we're getting better and better at. Um, I'd be interested to hear, like, specifically, like, what's a problem that you worked on this month that was something you were trying to figure out? Um, so we want to make sure that our reps, who we think are some of the best in the industry, have all the information they need at hand to make the best possible pricing decisions based on the market. And there's a lot of available tools, but using a combination of our in-house data and some proprietary algorithms, we think that we're now able to provide some of the best pricing guidance we've ever had before to those internal teams to set uh, rates that are competitive, but fair and actually executable. Is it because there's more data available to us now than than ever? I, that's definitely part of it, and okay. Echo has reached a scale where we certainly have certain advantages uh, in that we have a lot more data than a lot of other smaller companies. Okay. But it also, as was mentioned earlier today, about the use of the data. And so um, I think we've made some great strides in uh, selecting certain data. A lot of this is about what is the right comparison so if I'm going to look at a given shipment and I'm trying to divine what the right price for that shipment is, what other shipments should I compare that to is one of the ultimate questions at play there. And I think that we've made some great advances on how we do those comparisons and then any adjustments we take from there. Wow. And uh, I just had one question kind of about scale. You know, uh, obviously network effects are, you know, sort of proportional to the square of all of the engaged you know, users, right? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of economies of scale do very large brokerages have? What do they do differently than you know, small brokerages? Because at its essence, brokerages are sort of making or, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that they're making a market, a very particular market. It's a subset of the overall market. but. They're playing matchmaker between buyers and sellers. And so there are mathematically quantifiable scale advantages. Make up law. Yes. On both sides, both having more relationships with capacity on the one side, which gives you more flexibility, and more shipments on the other side, which also gives you flexibility in both directions. And I think that mm. some of the best brokers out there and individually have that sort of uh, beautiful mind, you know, kind of vision of how all this stuff comes together. But, but for most people, 
being able to see and sense all of that simultaneously actually is impossible. And that's where technology comes into play to sort of make that thought process and that awareness and that, that matching ability, what I would refer to as bionic, right? So sort of beyond what one person could do in their own head because you've got large scale on the one hand of supply and you've got large scale on the other hand of demand. Okay, well, so a considerable advantage. I liked what you said yesterday, uh, was it yesterday on stage where you said that, you know, what uh, technology allows you to do, what algorithms and, you know, artificially intelligent assistance, if you want to call it that, allow you to do is really to codify and systematize the best practices that the very smartest people are kind of doing instinctively yeah. um, and allow everyone in an organization to operate at that level. So that's really insightful. Yeah, that's a that's a big part of my whole purpose and mission. I mean, if sometimes when we develop an algorithm or or something, we we're asked how that compares to the performance of the best rep. But we don't only have the very best rep. If we did, we we could probably all retire right away, right? We've got this spectrum of performance and knowledge and skill and and history and experience, and so right the degree to which I or my team can help less experienced reps operate more like experienced reps is a serious advantage to all the players involved. It's an advantage to our profitability and our growth, but it's also an advantage to the <clears throat> shippers and the carriers that we deal with. Interesting. I've, I've seen really interesting charts, I think, in a, a Goldman Sachs study of brokerages. It was kind of talking about Landstar's uh, EBIT per employee or you know EBIT per agent over time like the and the longer you know after about 48 months you know the, the difference between a new agent and at 48 months is enormous and mm -hmm. I think like making that curve steeper mm -hmm. uh, you know is there's a massive opportunity there that's exactly right that's well, and that is, um, and you know what? This has been 10 good minutes. We're going to call this a conversation <laughs> with you, Scott. Massive, massive disaster. <laughs> you lose, Scott. Not at all. In fact, you get a thank you for the extra great co uh, content. We'll, well, that's what we'll call it. We'll call it a conversation with Scott Friesen. Um, and, uh, you know, thanks again for being here. Um, and this, this fits right in with one of our main themes and discussing the, you know, the obvious, the digitization um, that's happening um, uh, in our industry, uh, as well as just, I do, you know, overall it is revolutionary, even though there may be kind of an adjacent possible in making these things happen one step at a time. But um, thanks again for, for being here. Yeah, thanks, thanks dude. Awesome, Glad man. Here. Yeah, it was, it was fun. Thanks, guys. As always, we go into more detail about each of the topics we've talked about today on our website, FreightWaves.com. We will continue to publish this podcast weekly, so be sure to subscribe to What the Truck on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Also, make sure to leave us a review to let us know what you think of our new podcast. That'll do it for today. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next week on What the Truck.